Hi, everyone. Hello there. We are in Isaiah chapter 6 in Alexander McLaren's Expositions of Holy Scripture. And this is the call of Isaiah to his prophetic office. And he's given his assignment in this chapter. And for we who are ex Jehovah's Witnesses, this is very significant in many ways. So we'll, we'll first read the text from the NIV. Yes. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphims, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The one then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull. And, their, and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth, an oak tree, a oak leaf stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. Mm. So if we're witnesses, we're familiar with uh, this passage because we find our identity in verse 8 here I am send me we are volunteering yeah. to do the Lord's work and that's because the Lord no longer has his ancient people Israel or prophets mm. Jewish apostles or prophets to do his work well that's what is obviously missing here is that we're we're missing what the message is to Israel it's a judicial uh, it's a judicial judgment all right that is it's a it's a, a judicial blindness, You, I guess is a better way to think mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. A judicial blindness. And this text is the most quoted Old Testament text mm -hmm. in the New Testament. It's quoted in all four Gospels yeah. and in Acts and Romans, six times altogether. It's quoted. It's, it's Obviously, the early church thought it was a very important point to make yeah. that the blindness of Israel was part of the plan. Yeah, so it's it's an Israelite telling other Israelites that they're blind yeah, and they're not going to understand and they're not going to hear. Which of course relates to a very, uh, maybe the most important text that you have as a, an identity text if you're a Jehovah's Witness, Isaiah 43, mm -hmm. where if you read in context you realize that judicial blindness, that blindness was already upon them when Isaiah wrote the words in Isaiah 43, mm -hmm. and yet they're still called Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. That's totally missing from our worldview. but. Mm -hmm. Even even easier to put your finger on if you're a witness. You kind of know that in the New Testament, when Paul is asked in Romans 9 through 11, mm -hmm. is this 
is the situation of Israel in unbelief going to be permanent? Has God cast away his people? Paul says, God forbid. And he quotes By no this, means. this passage, right? Paul yeah. does. And then Jesus also quotes it in the parables, when he's telling the parables, and they say, why are you talking that way? Hmm? Why don't you just speak it out straight? <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> he quotes this passage. There was a reason why some of them were judicially blinded. And others were enlightened, and called mm -hmm. to a specific assignment, the apostles. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, other Jewish Christians, thousands of them. Mm -hmm. So the, the, rem, the remnant principle is still at, still in place, obviously. At, mm. In Paul, Paul sees even his own calling as an exhibition or proof that mm -hmm. God is still doing this. He's still calling people to himself despite their own will in the case of Saul of Tarsus, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the New Testament, you have 144,000 in Revelation. Revelation. Right. A small number compared to the great crowd that are immediately identified after them in Revelation 7 mm -hmm. from among the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. But apparently that's still the case, not just in the New Testament that there were tens of thousands of Jewish believers, but right until the end, because of course the 144,000 is called during the last judgments of the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a Jewish remnant, but then, as Paul says, all Israel will be saved. So this living stump, the tree is chopped down. There's judgment for sure, but there's a living stump that one day will grow mm. and bear fruit. Mm -hmm. Isaiah's message very plainly. Mm. Here's how McLaren deals with this, this text. We may deal with this text as, as falling into three parts. The vision, its effect on the prophet, and his commission. The vision, in the year that King Uzziah died, is more than a date for chronological accuracy. It tells not only when, but why the vision was given. The throne of David was empty. God never empties places in our homes and hearts, or in the nation, or the church, without being ready to fill them. He sometimes empties them that he may fill them. Sorrow and loss are meant to prepare us for the vision of God, and their effect should be to purge the inward eye that it may see him. When the leaves drop from the forest trees, we can see the blue sky, which their dense abundance hid. Well for us, if the passing of all that can pass drives us to him who cannot pass, if the unchanging God stands out more clear, more near, more dear, because of change. As to the substance of this vision, we need not discuss whether, if we had been there, we should have seen anything. It was doubtless related to Isaiah's thoughts. For God does not send visions which have no point of contact in the recipient. However communicated, it was a divine communication and a temporary unveiling of an eternal reality. The form was transient, but Isaiah then saw for a moment the things which are and always are. Mm. The essential point of the vision is the revelation of Jehovah as King of Judah. That relation guaranteed defense and demanded obedience. It was a sure basis of hope, but also a stringent motive to loyalty, and it had its side of terror as well as of joyfulness. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. The place of vision is the heavenly sanctuary of which the temple was a prophecy. Eminently significant and characteristic of the whole genius of the Old Testament is the absence of any description of the divine appearance. The prophet saw things which it is not lawful for a man to utter, and his silence is not only reverent, but more eloquent than any attempt to put the ineffable into words. Ineffable is it? In, ineffable? Mm. Okay. Even in this act of manifestation, God was veiled, and there was the hiding of his power. The train of his robe can be spoken of, but not the form which is concealed, even in revealing it. Nature is the robe of God. It hides while it discloses, and discloses while it hides. Hmm. Yeah. The, the reticence of, the, of this passage and all the passages where God is seen in some form in the Old Testament, he's never described, 
even yeah. though it says Jehovah appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, etc. And yeah. here he's never described. And I can't help but think that it's it's so odd that when you think about it, the, the New Testament never describes Jesus either. Mm-hmm. And yet, that, it wouldn't that be the very first thing you'd want to know? What did, yeah. he, what did he look like? Mm-hmm. But, but I think the thing that struck me again here is that he, McLaren, uses the name Jehovah so much. We noticed that, did we not, mm-hmm. when we did our project years ago? Yeah, I think we counted them in one of his books, the Psalms. Yeah, he has a three-volume set on the Psalms, and we actually took the trouble to count every use of the name mm-hmm. Jehovah because we wanted to contrast that with what we were used to in the way of propaganda. Yeah, the witnesses give you the indi- the idea that they had to restore this name. But when you go back to books of that time period, it was all over the place, in hymn books, in commentaries. So he was just one of many mm. where we kind of did a, a, a scan of that just to see how often they used that name. In the very days of Russell. Which I assumed... Nobody used. Mm -hmm. I mean, even when we were witnesses, I remember being surprised if I heard it in a movie or somebody else using it. But notice his loyalty to the text. He uses Jehovah or Yahweh in later commentaries. You'll see Yahweh, not Jehovah. Mm -hmm. He uses Jehovah, though, where it is in the original text. He's dealing with an Old Testament book. He never uses it in the New Testament context because he knows it's not there. Mm Mm-hmm. What is rapturously sung in the threefold invocation of the seraphs is the infinite exaltation of Jehovah above all creatural conditions, limitations, and we may add conceptions. That separation, of course, includes purity, as may be seen from the immediate effect of the vision on the prophet. But the very conception is much wider than that. Very beautifully does the second line of the song re-knit the connection between Jehovah and this world so far beneath him, which the burst of praise of his holiness seems to sever. The high heaven is a bending arc. Its inaccessible heights ray down sunshine and drop down rain. And as in the physical world, every plant grows by heaven's gift. So in the world of humanity, all wisdom, goodness, and joy are from the Father of lights. God's glory is the flashing luster of his manifested holiness, which fills the, the earth as the train of the road fills the temple. The the vibrations of that mighty hymn shook the foundations of the threshold with its thunderous harmonies. The house was filled with smoke, which since it was an effect of the seraph's praise, is best explained as referring to the fragrant smoke of incense, which as we know symbolize the prayers of saints. Mm. So this is a a majestic passage and and I think it it resonated with us when we read such passages in a new way when we left the Watchtower because of the difference what we we noted right away in mm. in the in the public gatherings of oh, the yeah. church versus yeah. the Watchtower. Yeah. So when I first started going to to church, yeah, I what I liked and what was so refreshing to me was that I felt like I was worshiping. There was a real sense of awe. Uh, you were you were there to worship to praise God mm-hmm. you weren't there to read publications or to get instruction all the time that's that was the witness way of, of doing things it was always there mm-hmm. even their songs were yeah. instructive but when you went to church you heard the word of God not publications you heard the word of God together as a community mm-hmm you you sang together and the music was better <laughs> yeah it was more worshipful more praising of god than i was used to and i it did something to my soul right away yeah to to hear this and to so i think sometimes people reject church when they're witnesses without really knowing that the format is not like the watchtower's format yeah it's not a, a mechanism. Church is not a mechanism to control your thinking. That's right. They, what they're there for is to worship together. Yeah. And to hear the word of God together. That's a very large difference. Mm-hmm. We wanted to link to two videos, one on the attributes of God, about James Orr's book on 
basic theology, and an another one based on the work of Charles Cranfield, who mm. in his commentary on Mark made the point that we have to answer the question, especially in the Gospel of Mark, as to why, why, the, why did Christ veil his glory? Mm. Why is he so reluctant to even have his own disciples proclaim him Messiah? Yeah. That's a very important point. If mm -hmm. you're a, a, a Jehovah's Witness or, for that matter, a Muslim, you're always asking, well, if Jesus was really what the church says he is, well, why didn't he make why didn't he just larger say public issues? Up. Yeah. yeah. You would, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not God's method. It's not God's method in the Old Testament. He's mm -hmm. often it's oblique. The message is is oblique and for from from our standpoint a little too vague. Mm -hmm. We'll continue uh, McLaren's discussion of Isaiah chapter six next time. Mm -hmm.